Great. Good afternoon. Uh, for the next 30 minutes or so, I'll talk about buffer sizing in internet routers. The goal is to find out how small we can make uh, buffers without any major degradation in system performance. Uh, this is a joint work with Guido Appenzale. As mentioned, he gave a talk last year uh, here about the work we had done at that time. And also Mihaila Inacesco, Ashish Gual, Tim Rafkadan, and Nick McKeown, all from Stanford University. Let me start with the story. Uh, I'm going to talk about three different rules for buffer sizing in the core of the internet. The first one, which I refer to as the rule of thumb, is the rule which is used today for buffer sizing. And it is the 2T times C. I will talk about what T and C are in a moment. And it basically comes from the assumption that we want to have 100% utilization on the links. And uh, the second rule, which was uh, recently proposed by uh, Guido, Nick, and Isaac, basically, claims that if we have n flows in the core of the internet, we can reduce the buffer size by a factor of a square root of n. Today, we have tens of thousands of flows going through the routers, core routers. So based on this rule, we can reduce the buffer size by a factor of at least 100. And the last one, which is a more recent result which we proposed, basically says that you can re reduce the buffer size even more to a log of W. W is the maximum congestion window size of the flows going through the router. And if you apply each of these rules to a, a 10 gigabit per second link, based on the first rule, we'll have, we'll have to have a buffer size of 1 million packets. The second rule reduces this, month, this uh, buffer size to just 10,000 packets. And based on the last rule, I'll have, uh, we'll just need to have 20 packets of buffer sizing. The, of course, the, the assumption here in the last result is that we are not going to have 100% link utilization. I'll talk about that in more details in a few moments. For each of these rules, I'll try to give you the reason and the intuition behind why, where this rule comes from. And then I will show you some evidence that validates that result. OK, let me start with the rule of thumb, which is the one used today. A universally applied rule of thumb says that if you want to have a core router uh, to have 100% utilization at all times, the buffer size should be equal to 2t times c. 2T is the two-way propagation delay of the packets going through the router, and C is the capacity of the link. This is mandated in backbone and edge routers and appears in RFPs, IETF architectural guidelines. And in the literature, is usually referenced to a paper by Velazimer and Sang, but based on an email in an end-to-end -end mailing list, we believe that it was known uh, much before than that. And if you take a closer look at this rule, you can see that even though we don't expect T to change over time that much, we expect capacity to grow dramatically. And so the buffer size should also grow linearly with capacity. And it has major consequences in router design. OK, let me show you where this rule comes from. Amazingly, this rule comes from a setting with a single TCP flow. As you all know, TCP is a window-based congestion control scheme in the sense that whenever the source sends a packet towards the destination, it keeps the packet inside the congestion window until it receives an acknowledgment back from the receiver. At that time, the source removes that packet from the congestion window. For TCP to uh, maintain 100% link utilization uh, at the bottleneck link, the way it changes the congestion window size W is that whenever it receives an acknowledgment back from the receiver, it, incre it increments the congestion window size W by 1 over W. And whenever it, it finds out the packet is lost, for any reason, the congestion window size is halved. Of course, this is a simplification, but for all purposes, I'll use this model. Now, in this example, as you can see, the, the congestion window size will keep increasing until the pipes, basically the links connecting the source to the destination, 
and the links connecting the destination back to the source, they all become full. At this point, what happens is by increasing the congestion window size, the, buck, uh, the buffer will start filling up. And the same thing will happen until the buffer becomes full. Note that during this time, the utilization of the bottleneck link is 100%. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that the reason buffers, the packet sizes change is because this bottleneck link capacity is lower than the other links. Now, when the buffer becomes full, which is at this point, when the window size is increased by one, there is no room for that packet and the packet becomes dropped, and when the source is notified of that packet drop, it will have the window size. Now, note that when the window size is halved, the uh, source stops sending more packets until it receives enough ac acknowledgments back from the receiver. During that time, if you want to have 100% link utilization, we should uh, have a large buffer so that it can keep the link busy during that time. And that's exactly where this uh, 2T times C bandwidth uh, delay product comes from. Okay. To, I, I, we can see that the, the congestion window size changes between W max and W max over two. And if we want to have, when the congestion window size is at W max over two, if we want to have 100% utilization, we should have the uh, pipes full, which means we should have at least two T times C packets outside. And therefore, the difference between W max and W max over two, which is basically the buffer size, should also be two T times C. Okay. Validating res results should be very easy. You just need to do some simulations or uh, uh, just change the uh, buffer size on a router and have a single TCP flow going, go through that router. I have here the simulations result for a buffer size of 2T times C, which is exactly the rule of thumb. In the top graph, you can see the congestion window size, and in the bottom graph, you can see the buffer occupancy. As you can see, when the congestion window size is increased and it reaches its maximum, the buffer size will become full. At this point, we'll have a packet drop, and the congestion window size is halved. But the buffer size never remains at zero. Basically, it immediately starts building up again because by having the window size, we have never uh, removed any packet from the pipe. And the middle curve basically shows that the utilization remains at 100% utilization at all times. Now, if the buffer size were, was less than 2T times C, what happens is that when we have the congestion window size, the buffer becomes empty but it will remain empty for a while before we can fill up the pipe. And during that time, the utilization goes below 100%. So that's basically why we need 100% utilization when there's a single flow, single TCP flow going through the system. Now, in the core of the internet, obviously we don't have a single flow. Maybe. 20 years ago, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, having one or two flows were common. But today, we have tens of thousands of flows. And the question is, now what happens to this rule of thumb? Do we, you still need to use the same rule, or can we change it? The answer is this. If all of the flows which are going through the core router are synchronized, the dynamics of the sum of the congestion window sizes will be very similar to the dynamics of a single TCP flow. Therefore the buffer occupancy will have very similar dynamics and we will need to use the same amount of buffering as before. Basically, the rule of thumb still holds. But if those flows are not synchronized, if for some reason, for any reason, the flows are desynchronized, we can mathematically show that the variations in the sum of the congestion window sizes will become smaller and st smaller as we increase the number of flows. In fact, we can mathematically show that if the flows are independent of each other based on central limit theorem, the distribution of the sum of the congestion window sizes will look very much like a Gaussian. And the interesting point here is that 
the variance of this distribution, which is basically the buffer size we need. We need to have a buffer size which can accommodate the variations in the sum of congestion window sizes. This variance is reduced by a factor of a square root of n, where n is the number of long-lived TCP flows going through the system. So I'm not going to more details than this. We have a paper in SICM 2004, and for anyone who is interested, I can give a copy of that paper. But the, in, the more important part for this project was uh, validating this result. To that end, the simplest way to validate these results, of course, at least for people in academia, is to do simulations. We did thousands of NS2 simulations. You can see one of them here, a very simple one. The x-axis is the number of TCP flows, and the uh, y-axis is the minimum buffer size which we need. The green curve shows the analytical model, the 2t times c divided by square root of n. And the red dots are basically simulation results. You can see that when the number of flows is more than 30, 40 flows, the two curves match very closely. But when the number of flows are less than 30 or 40, they do not match. The reason is that when the number of flows are less than 30, 40, the central limit theorem does not apply in that setting. But Simulations are nice, but they're might not, they might not be really representative of what happens in a real network. So we have tried to do experiments in real uh, networks. The first experiment that we did was on traffic coming out of one of the dorm dorms at Stanford University. Uh, the capacity of link was not that high. It was just 100 megabits per second, but it was highly utilized at all times. And we had a variety of traffic going through that link. We reduced the buffer size, didn't see any major degradation in system performance. We did an experiment at the Whale Lab, University of Wisconsin's Whale Lab. There, in this test bed, we generated traffic using several PCs, 40 PCs, each generated 10 flows, so we had 40, 400 flows, and reduced the buffer size by a factor of 20, and didn't see any degradation in system performance. Internet 2 did some experiments and they reduce the buffer size to uh, 50, 20, 10, 2, and 1 milliseconds on their backbone. And, sorry. And interestingly, they did not see uh, any degradation in system performance. And more interestingly, we later realized that when they were thinking they're reducing the buffer size to 10, 5, 2, 1 millisecond. They were reducing it to 1 microseconds, actually. And it appears there are some hidden buffers in the router which we didn't take into account. And we are working with them to uh, redo those experiments. But the last experiment which we have done is uh, performed by level 3 communications, which we are very thankful to. This was the most exciting experiment because it was done on, a, on an operational internet backbone and I'm going to talk about it in more details. There are several things that make uh, this experiment very interesting. The first one was uh, we had three parallel links. The traffic coming to the router was load balanced over these three parallel links. This gives us an opportunity to reduce the buffer size on one of those links and find out what happens to the system performance. Basically, if we had just one link, the problem is you cannot tell if, if the throughput, for example, goes down. You, can, you cannot tell if that happened for some other reason or that buffer sizing change caused that. But here we have a way of apple to apple comparison of the results. The other interesting thing was that the, the, uh, this, these three links were very highly utilized. Basically, at the peak time, the, at, at peak, they were up to 95% utilized, which was very interesting. And the buffer size reduction did take uh, about two weeks. We reduced the buffer size and kept the buffer at that level for about two weeks. And the buffer sizes which we tried was 190 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, 5, 2.5, and 1 milliseconds. And we measured the performance using uh, traces, uh, using data collected every 30 seconds, the drops and utilization data. And we also had, had some test flows injected through the system to see how they perform during the experiment. OK. Here, 
is one of the graphs that shows packet drops as a function of load for buffer sizes of 190 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, and 5 milliseconds. And as you can see, almost at all times, we did not see even a single packet drop. Note that the maximum throughput, uh, maximum utilization on this link can be up to 2.4 gigabits per second. And even when the utilization was very high, we even didn't see a single packet drop in the system. When we pushed the buffer size down to one millisecond, we started to see some packet drops. Interestingly, as you can see in this graph, there were only seven or eight incidents during which we had a packet drop rate of more than 0.02%. Note that this, these seven, eight uh, incidents happened during the course of two weeks. And uh, the, the only time that we had a bunch of packet drives happening was when the link utilization was very high, and that's quite normal. Despite what some people think, packet drops are not necessarily bad. TCP's only way of realize, getting feedback from system is packet drops. If there are no packet drops, TCP has no way of realizing there is congestion somewhere in the network. So these packet drops which happen with, at high utilization are quite okay, we believe. Now, the question is uh, how did the throughput change as a function of buffer size reduction? What I have here is I have plotted the ratio of the utilization on two links, the link with one millisecond buffering and a link with 190 millisecond buffering. Ideally, if there is no change in utilization, what you will see is a straight line which shows one at all times. Basically, the two utilizations should be the same. but uh, to our surprise, the link with less buffering had a higher utilization, which was very interesting. And more interestingly, if you plot this curve in, an, in another way, which is this one, basically in the x-axis I have the utilization of the link with one millisecond buffering, and then in the y-axis I have the utilization of the link with 190 millisecond. And each point, each blue dot represents a 30 second time interval. Uh, you can see that ideally if the two utilizations were the same at all times, we should have all points lying on this uh, purple line, 45 degree line. And as you can see, the link with one millisecond buffering shows higher utilization at periods which load is higher. Uh, we were very excited at first thinking, oh, not only we did not reduce the uh, utilization by reducing the buffer size, but also we got some better performance, higher utilization. But it turns out this is not because of changes in buffer size, but as a result of imperfections in load balancing scheme. And ideally what we should have done was to reverse the buffer sizes on two links, on the two links, and see if the reverse thing happens. But we could not do that because the, uh, those links were gone after our simulation, uh, after our experiments were done. They, they were over provisioned and uh, some other links that was added to the network. Now, this new result has great uh, uh, consequences in buffer size, uh, in r designing routers. Basically, with one million packets, you have to have uh, buffer, you, you can't have on chip buffers but with this one, you can put buffers on a corner of, uh, of the uh, chip when you're designing router buffers. But in the next rule that I'm going to talk about, we're thinking about a different setting. Basically, the motivation for this one was we are working on a project that uh, aims at building an all-optical network. In an all-optical network, you not only switch packets, uh, not only transfer packets in optics, but also do the switching in optics you do not convert packets into electronic signals. And of course, since you don't have large buffers in optics, the only way to keep packets is to keep them in delay lines. And there are some results that uh, show in five, 10 years, we will have buffers of up to 20 packets. Now the question was, if we reduce the buffer size to 20 packets, can we gain acceptable throughput in the system or not? Of course, in an all-optical network, the capacity is not a 
major problem anymore. It's not the bottleneck. We are not aiming at reaching 100% utilization at all times because of a uh, huge amount of capacity that is available. Let me step back for a second here and compare what we have in theory and practice. Theoretically, if you have a, a queue with rivals which are uh, smooth, basically, for example, a Poisson arrival to a queue, and assuming that the load is low, you can have very, very small amount of uh, packet drops with very, very small buffer sizes. For example, if load is at 80% uh, 80 and the buffer size is just 20 packets, we can get less than 1% packet drops. Now, this loss is independent of link rate. It doesn't depend on RTTs or number of flows. However, in practice, as you already know, an OC192 router line card has more than 1 million packets of buffering. The, there are basically five orders of magnitude difference between what we have in practice and what uh, we can have in theory. And the question is, can we make traffic look like Poisson or Poisson enough such that we can use the benefits of such uh, low loss, uh, loss rates? The answer to this question is yes, and uh, this is basically a mathematical theorem which I'll try to explain very intuitively. If, if we have a buffer size of log W max, W max is the maximum congestion window in the system, and alpha is a constant here. I will not talk about that one. And assuming that any two packets from the same flow have a space between them, Basically, packets are not injected to the system back to back. They're not, the, the, any two packets of the same flow going through the router have a space of beta log W max. Beta, again, is a constant, which is not really important at this point. If we can ensure that, and assuming that the flows are not synchronized and they are start independently from each other, we can prove that the packet drop probability can remain very low with just 10 to any packets. Uh, we worked on this in parallel with some folks in the University of Cambridge, University of College London, and UMass. And interestingly, even though we did not, we uh, purposefully did, tried not to collaborate, we tried to uh, work independent of each other. At the end, we reached the same results, and all of those papers are published in uh, last July's ACMCCR. I can give you copies if you're interested after the talk. Now, if you take a look at the, in the core of the internet, most of the time, core links are not highly utilized. You have a load which is, say, for example, less than 80% at all points of time. And we believe there is a natural spacing between the two packets of most of the flows. This is because slow access links are, uh, access links are usually slower than core links. So even if you send two packets back to back, for example, on a DSL line, when they reach the core, naturally there will be some spacing between the two. And even if you have a network with high access link capacity, basically, for example, if Slack wants to use these kind of results, what they have to do is just change a few lines of source code in TCP, convert it to a paste TCP version basically putting some space between any two packets injected to the system. So that should, shouldn't be uh, very difficult. And if we have all these conditions, we can show that the traffic will look like uh, Poisson, uh, and the loss rate will be very low, and it doesn't depend on RTTs of flows and the number of flows. And based on that, we can show that with a buffer size of just 10 to 20 packets, we can gain high throughput. And by high, I mean 80, 70 percent utilization. Let me show you where this, let me show you a very uh, simple example of where this result comes from. Here I have two leaky buckets. The one in the left uh, is filled with very large water drops. I will show you why I use water drops here. And the one in the right has uh, 
very small water drops coming in, they have 90% load. Basically, they are draining water at the rate of 90% at all times. As you can see, and the graphs on the bottom show the water level as a function of time. If you take a closer look at these two uh, cases, you can see that even though the load is the same on these two cases, the water level variations is much more for the case where we have large packet, not packet drops, sorry, water drops. And if, but for the one which we have smaller water drops, the changes in water level is much more smaller. Okay, this is very simplistic, of course, but I want to show that this is exactly what happens with TCP Reno. Okay, I have two sources, S1 and S2, generating packets. The packets go through a router R1, and the destination node is R2. R1 has one unit of buffering available, and I assume sources are generating packets using TCP Reno, a very simplified version of TCP Reno in this case. Each of the sources send one packet, packets reach the destination, we get acknowledgments back. The interesting part is that when S2 receives the acknowledgement, it increments the window size and sends two packets back to back. And this keeps continuing when those two packets arrive at the source, we will have three packets sent out back to back. This is exactly this, what happens in the large water drops case. Basically, a bunch of packets sent together look like a huge water drop. And so if you have just one unit of buffering available, one of those will be dropped. And the same thing will ha happen with the packets of the uh, first source. Okay. But on the other hand, if somehow I can manage to change TCP to insert some spacing between the packets, I haven't talked about the details of how much spacing we need. If someone is interested, I can talk about it offline. But if for some reason we have some spacing between the two packets, we can show that the variations in the buffer occupancy, which is basically the same as the variations in the water level in the previous example, the variations will become much, much smaller. And therefore, with much, much smaller buffers, we will, we will be able to gain higher throughput. Here, I haven't modified TCP. We have assumed that there is a minimum amount of spacing as a result of uh, slow access links generating packets. Okay, regarding validation of this new scheme, unfortunately we haven't been able to do uh, real network experiments. You should tell me why nobody dares to reduce the buffer size to 10 packets. We are trying to convince people to do that in their backbone. But until we can do that, we have done some NS2 simulations. What I have here is throughput of a system as a function of the buffer size. Let's for now just focus on the blue curve. The x-axis is the buffer size and the y-axis is throughput. You can see that as I increase the buffer size from one packet to 100 packets in this uh, case, the throughput goes up from something around 5% to around 95%. The, cur the graph on the right is the same graph as the other one, but in the uh, logarithmic scale. This is if we use regular TCP. If I modify UTCP using uh, pacing, or if I have slow access links which cause packets to have some natural spacing between them, you can see that with just only 10 packets of buffering, the utilization reaches 80%. The other curves uh, in the, uh, on these graph show a different number of flows. For, ex for example, the uh, red one is intended to reach 50%. And as you can see, it reaches that level with just five units of buffering. Whereas in the second one, 
in the uh, regular TCP case, we need at least 40 packets. Now, if in, the, in this uh, second example, what I'm doing is I'm increasing the number of flows, and at the same time, I'm increasing the capacity of the bottleneck link. So basically, the load, the uh, effective load coming to the system is kept fixed as, at 80%. And here I have the uh, red curve, which, in which, uh, which shows the performance of TCP Reno, and the blue curve shows the performance of Pace TCP. You can see that TCP Reno remains, uh, and the buffer size is 10 packets only. TCP Reno has just 20% utilization, but Pace TCP gains 70% out of 80% load, actually. And no matter what the number of flows is and what the capacity is, the throughput will remain fixed. Okay? So, the next step for this project is doing experiments on real operational networks. Ideally, what we want to have is, uh, by the way, this router is a Juniper router. I didn't know that when I was preparing the slides. It doesn't mean anything to me. We love Juniper, Cisco, anybody who helps us do experiments. And the, ideally what we want to do is to reduce the buffer size on a core router, which has high load and, uh, the, of course, realistic or real traffic. And we want to have full control of the, over the buffer sizes in this router. For some routers, it's very difficult to reduce, reduce the buffer sizes. And the problem of hidden buffers is, uh, becomes uh, very important when you want to reduce the buffer size to just 10 packets. And Ideally, we want to collect traces of packets coming and leaving the router so that we can build the, the time series of how long each packet has stayed inside the router. This is a work in prog progress. Right now, we are working with Sprint, Verizon, Telcordia, and Lucent uh, to do experiments on this. And to summarize, what we have done the on the theory, theory side is that we have shown if you reduce the buffer size today by a factor of the square root of n, where n is the number of long-lived TCP flows, you will not see any change in the performance of the network. We have showed that you can further reduce the buffer size down to 20 packets. And of course, under certain con constraints, the network should be over-provisioned. And uh, we should either have paste TCP or we have flows which come through act slow access links. And again, the, we can gain very high utilizations in those cases. On the experimental side, we have done thousands of NS2 simulations. We have done experiments at Stanford Dorm, University of Wisconsin's Whale Lab, Internet 2, Level 3 Communications. And this is an ongoing work, and I'm here to ask for your help to see if you can give me feedback or help us in any way to perform more experiments on real networks. Thank you, and if you have any questions or if you want some more information about the papers that I talked about, uh, you can email me or you can take a look at the project uh, website. Okay. Is this on now? Don't ask questions Thank you. yet. One quick, couple quick questions for you. On slide 13, where you showed packet loss with your uh, tiny buffers, I'm curious, did that correspond into events, network events in the network, i.e., did it break? Pardon? Um, does the loss, the outliers in the graph there, correspond to breaks in the network, or are they just unknowns? Uh, as far as I know, network did not break okay, during good. any time during the experiment. Okay, good. That was the answer I wanted. So the next question is, so have you modeled this? So it sounds like this is all modeled in a steady state system. Have you modeled this in a network or system where it breaks and determined if you get the same behavior? In a system that breaks? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by break? Like when 14 192s go away at a given point in time. Oh, okay. No, no. We haven't looked at failures in the system at all. No. We haven't considered see, that. See, because that's where we like buffers in routers, you see. That's a good time to have buffers. Yes, yes. I mean, the motivation um, for this work was, as I told you before, the, the all-optical project. And the question wasn't just uh, 
what, I mean, it's a, it's a totally unexplored area. Okay. The question was, if you reduce the buffer size to 20 packets, can we have high utilization at all? Well, and obviously, what you, we can have done it, so you can run it at 98% and it'll work. But when it breaks... Yes. No, you're not going to buffer the entire length. I know what you're saying. Yes, yes, that's, that's, that's a legitimate concern, and we haven't studied that, no. no. Okay, well, one other, good, one other question, because that was a nice segue about the optical part. So we all love this panacea of the all optical network and the optical switch, but I still haven't seen the secret sauce that says, this is how we switch ingress flows across an optical backplane, uh, multiple egresses. How does that work? Still waiting to see that one. So maybe we should ask uh, optical community, right? I'm this, the project that we are working on is a huge project. Part of it is done in U UCSB. Basically, the optics group over there, they have built these devices. Very nice results. They have optical memories, and they have this full wavelength conversion devices, which basically, with that, the reason we have been able to work on this project was assuming that we have full wavelength conversion. What's the difference between optical memory and buffer? In optical memory, basically, you keep rotating packets, and you can't do it for a long time. They have delay lines, keep the packets rotating in a delay line for a while. So in a, in a buffer, you have a packet there, and you can keep it there for forever. For, but well, in an, Yeah, not forever, but for time. For a very anymore. long yeah, time, you can keep it in a buffer. In an electronic router, uh, in an electronic buffer, there is no limitations on how long you can keep the packet in the buffer. Not in the sense of, I mean, uh, from the network's point of view. But in optics, if you insert the packet in a delay line, you have to send it out. I'm after. not trying to knock the work because I would love to see less memory in routers because that corresponds to substantially less cost. Mm -hmm. But I still don't, I'm not convinced of the optical router approach yet. Um, I just haven't seen it actually work. So that's Hopefully. why I ask. We, we, we don't claim that you can see it right now. We are trying to reach there in five, ten years. Uh, all right. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I had the optical router right here, I didn't need to ask for your help to convince <laughs> others to reduce the buffer size. Yeah, you would. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. Next. Uh, two quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, when you said that pacing the TCP wasn't difficult from software, my back of the envelope says that that's 13,000 interrupts a second uh, with jumbo frames. And when we increased the Linux clock to 1,000 times a second, we had to reduce it to, a, to 500 interrupts a second. So I think you need to talk to the interrupt, to the Ethernet card vendors about offloading that into the hardware. And my second question is, Sally Floyd's work on synchronized flows on one side, and you saying flows must be independent for this to work, seem to conflict it to an extent. And my question, I suppose, is: Is Red sufficiently? Does Red make the randomise the the packet arrival time sufficiently for your assumption of independence to be sustained? Uh, about the first comment, yes, I agree. Implementing paste TCP uh, with today's Linux and line cards is very difficult. In fact. Uh, we have encountered the same problem. The, the reason in the Wisconsin lab ex uh, experiment, the reason we didn't go beyond 10 flows per PC was exactly the timer issues. If you go beyond that, you def obviously can generate more and more flows, but the flows will become bursty because of the TCP, uh, sorry, Linux timers. About the second comment, we believe today in the core of the internet, you don't have a lot of synchronization. And the reason, uh, uh, the reason when you reduce the buffer size to one millisecond, and you, at, at least this can be uh, an evidence for that. If you reduce the buffer size to one millisecond and don't see a lot of packet drops, it can show that you don't have lots of synchronization in the core of the internet. If you had lots of synchronization, you should have seen much more packet drops. And about red, I, I was, uh, we have done some work on using red to reduce synchronization uh, for the 20 packet buffer size case. And amazingly, I find out, found out that when we're using red, we will see more synchronization in the uh, cases that we were interested in. 
And the reason, uh, let me put it this way, the TCP Reno is very unfair in short term. So basically you drop lots of packets from a single flow, even though that flow is sacrificed, your overall throughput doesn't go much down that much. But if you want to make the system more fair in short term, what you have to do is drop packets from different flows and that translates to lower uh, utilization. And what RED does in very, very small buffers case is very similar to making systems more fair. Basically, you're dropping packets from more and more flows rather than sacrificing a few flows. And uh, in that case, RED really doesn't help that much. Okay, so we have one last question and then a few closing remarks sure. and then we can all go drink or whatever. Were you using the Harpoon simulation system at Whale? Pardon me? Were you using the Harpoon simulation system? No, no. Uh, in Wisconsin lab, I believe it was used, uh, but it had some problems with bursty traffic generation. But that's kind of the tenet of Poisson self-similarity, isn't it? Pardon me? Isn't that one of the tenets of small time scale self-similarity, which you would want to try to simulate? Uh, harpoon? I. So we'll I'm talk sorry, offline. Even Ad Zorgesman is at Whale. I used to work with him. And I I was just curious if you were using Harpoon, since it does precisely what you were where you're going where you're going with this. Uh, that was one of the experiments we did. But for the rest of the experiments, we tried to, uh, I mean, generate, the, uh, use realistic traffic, basically, not uh, artificially generated traffic. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs>